Hello and welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. My name is Laura Bradburn and this, as always, is a Friday Axon podcast. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by Tony Haggerty. How are you doing, Tony? I'm very well, Laura. Yourself? Not too bad. Colin, how are you doing? I'm doing good, you know. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of messages asking where Jim is. This has been a couple of weeks now I've been standing in the, the king's seat, but... Um, hopefully not too long before he's back um, I know there's a lot going on just now and if you check him out on Twitter there's some interesting news about his play coming up so check that out three in a row absolutely that is yeah <laughs> getting there <laughs> well listen guys I've already had to make a switch we are having some amount of technical problems today so I've switched my camera sorry for the poor quality but we are I don't know we're, we're, we're bringing you a show come hell or high water that's for sure um, <laughs> so what Laura was about to say is the player who is her mystery Celt today is Adam Virgo um, the former Brighton Celtic and I don't know he had about 13 teams Tony didn't he um, what was your memories of Adam Virgo then <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story uh, uh, Laura reminds me there was a guy who used to phone the uh, the, the Scottish newspapers. His wife was bilingual, not bilingual. She was multilingual, and uh, he would scour all the magazines in Europe and find some tenuous link with somebody talking about Scottish football. He was a guy called Steve Goodman, and all right. so he he phoned once and he got through to my line. So he kept phoning my extension, and he would come on and say, "Tony, yeah, Roberto Bisconti." Remember him? <laughs> so, and it would be some kind of like obscure player that had played in Scottish football for five minutes, right? So with Dimitri Karin and Adam Virgo, I'm going to have a Steve Goodman with a lot of choices here, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, Adam Virgo, remember him? Danny Fox, remember him? <laughs> uh, at least Danny Fox played about a dozen games, Laura. Where did we get Adam Virgo from? You know, I, I, just, I, I have no real recollection of Adam Virgo playing for Celtic or playing well. <laughs> you know, I, I just know he was a, I think, did Strachan sing them, didn't he? Yes, that is my yeah. Yeah. And I believe he's a better commentator than he is than he was footballer. That might be disparaging towards him, and I don't mean it that way. Just as a Celtic player, it's like I, I am Steve Goodman on it, you know. Yeah. Country, remember him? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's spoken in some German magazine about how Scottish football is tight. You know what I mean? There was always somebody slagging Scottish football, and it's usually some guy that played for Aberdeen or Dunfermline or, or Livingston, you know. Yeah, and it was just it was just funny whenever you lifted the phone you just knew oh here we go Who, who's who's speaking in some magazine this week so I got a touch I've, of that when I saw the the, the Celt this week you know yeah I've got I, to say Laura see what I, do, I know you're a football manager player yourself uh, Tony I don't know if you were the old champ manager or what it was back in the day um, but I, I remember when we signed players and I'm talking like 10-15 years ago what you used to have to wait for is when Football Manager came out that season and you saw the positions that they were comfortable in playing in. His dot was all over the park. He could have played left-back, right-back, centre-back, midfield, up front. He was useless in all of them, but he could play there. He was the ultimate utility man. <laughs> Consistently useless. That that's the, that's it, man. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah. I think the, 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 reason nice it, the reason it came to mind... Sorry, Tony. The reason it came to mind was, of course, I, I, te- I, I tweeted a, a somewhat poorly worded joke on the back of the Mitchell Index, at which we'll come to, um, regarding the fact that obviously he was uh, the replacement for a certain Dewey uh, at, at centre back when we lost two one to Clyde. Now, Tony, uh, sorry, Colin. I know you'll know <laughs> what it's like to throw out something that you think is rather innocuous and then get somewhat of a backlash that's slightly bigger than you expected but um, yeah it just it, it, it was funny because I thought I thought the defence against Michelin was getting very harshly criticised considering of course on paper it was one of the worst defences we've ever fielded but I, I think the point I was trying to make was they didn't actually perform all that badly did they Colin? No, I thought they, they were actually fairly decent um, on Thursday, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I'm already slipping into the Europa League. Um, we'll get to that. No, Wednesday night, they actually did okay. Um, you could tell where players weren't comfortable in playing in those positions. They didn't quite know. Um, I'm thinking like the, the full-backs 
Ange wants him to play invertedly. You see Taylor and Ralston coming into the middle of the park to try and pick up the ball. They're not quite comfortable with that yet. Um, Dane Murray for the, the goals he just didn't have the right side of the defender and that's to be expected from them the young inexperienced players and that will come but they threw their bodies on the line, they were given their all um, and I tell you what, if it wasn't for the fact that um, we didn't score, uh, when Forrest missed that chance, you wouldn't have been talking about this, if you'd have made it 2-0 that game would have been done and dusted Yeah, I think it would have been yeah. uh, Tony, just to come to you I, I a lot of people are saying it would have only taken one or two signings to make the difference in that game. Do you agree? Uh, very much so. I, I, you know, we felt it went one nil up in both those legs and couldn't hold on to the lead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you play what you like. They, they put themselves in full position to qualify. Uh, I've been a real harsh critic of Anthony Ralston, but I have to say I thought he, he was Celtic's best player the other night. In fact, alongside the other two defenders, I... I, I know people had had a go at Dane Murray, but when you look at the goals, there's a boy ran off Turnbull for the second goal and crossed it in. And Dane Murray's in no man's land. And for the first goal, the, the the guy ran off Taylor and got in between the space mm-hmm. between Murray and Taylor. So I am I, I absolve kind of Dane Murray. He's learning on the job, and, and that's to be expected. And if he was a wee bit more positionally aware, he could have maybe. Of sort of, but the goals weren't his fault. It was the passages of play before that when an experienced player like Turnbull for the second goal just allows a guy to run off him as the boys chipping the ball through. Can he legislate for that? And Greg Taylor was ball watching as the guys ran across him and got his head to the ball. And Dane Murray's kind of reacted slowly. Fair enough, but um, I'm not going to lambast the young kid for that because it was a needs must job. You know, Stephen Welsh again put in another, had another reckless challenge on somebody which he has to iron out his game because the goal came in the first leg came from a, a reckless challenge and a needless one that he didn't have to make you know and I thought Ralston was excellent I, I, I've i said my piece on Ralston and I, I, I still don't think he'll cut it as a Celtic player but I'm going to give credit where it's due he, he was a, a standout performer for Celtic against Mitchell and it wouldn't be hard and you have to turn around and say when Anthony Ralston's your best player and a, and a game of that magnitude, then, you know, there's there's something seriously wrong in terms of the personnel and, and your lack of strength and depth. But I can go back to they they got themselves into pole position in both games and can contrive to throw it away. Because that's a bang average Danish team. I think they, they had three shots on, or three efforts on target over two legs and scored with the three of them. Mm. Uh, someone can correct them that, but I think that was a, the start. That tells you it all, really. You, you said something there, Tony. You said about ironing out, or you could say it was ironing out because yeah. what you're saying about Welsh is what we said about Ayer at the beginning as well. Yeah, we said about someone who was always throwing himself into tackles. Um, there was a couple of times in his younger Celtic career where the ball was maybe coming towards him. It was on the halfway line or just after the halfway line and he would dive in instead of staying on his feet and that let the, the striker get forward and get past him. Um, and I think Murray's, sorry, not Murray, Welsh is like that as well at the moment. And that comes from maturity and he will, that will mature out of his game. Um, but the, the signs have been good so far, I have to say, um, for Welsh. Tell you somebody else who needs to curb his enthusiasm. I see the last week as well, Sorrow. Thor has to learn to just walk and stand and stand and, and, and run alongside that guy. You can't keep him through people because by, by the totting up procedure he got booked the other night, but the referee was very lenient because he let him mm-hmm. into a ego before he eventually gave him a, a yellow card. He'll not get away with that in Scotland. First one he'll get a warning, second one he'll be booked, third one he'll be off. You know, it, it's just the way it is and he has to learn because he charges about the park and I, I do like his energy and his enthusiasm, but he has to channel that in the right way. Or else he'll be no use because he'll pick up cards galore, suspensions galore. And, you know, that's why I said last week I think Celtic also do, could do with another midfield enforcer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll come to Sora in a minute because I had my own thoughts on him. Um, I, I thought he I thought he ran about the park a bit like a headless chicken, didn't really mm. seem to have any 
Mental awareness that seemed to have any awareness of where Callum McGregor and, and, and Turnbull and Christie and, and Abada were on the pitch and almost seemed to be getting in their way at times. But we'll come to the forward line uh, or, or the, the forward lines of the team in a wee second. Colin, I wanted to, to ask your opinion because Tony and I and Jim were on a podcast a few weeks ago where Dan Orlowitz from Japan Times came on and was talking about... Um, Ange Postacoglu telling us not to worry about the defence and telling us not to worry about, you know, that um, that he's not a defensively minded coach. Obviously, Carol Starfelt's come in this week, looks to be a signing that might help to rectify that problem. But is anything you're seeing so far from his coaching suggestive to you that, that defence is going to be a concern once, even if we get more experienced players into the team? I think if he gets the players that he knows can play the system he wants to play, then there shouldn't be a concern. But at the minute, and I said this on Wednesday as well, I feel like we're telling players who can't play in the system he's looking to play, just do it anyway. I mean, there was times where you're trying to pass the ball out for the back. I think um, Scott Bain just about gave us a heart attack a couple of times when he tries to do the wee flick on the ball or he's trying to pass it out to the side and the striker's closing him down. Um these players obviously can't play that sort of system at the moment and that's why I was saying on Wednesday it's a case of play to your strengths at the moment yes you want to implement your style you can do it in bits and pieces but buy yourself that time Um, and I don't think the players that are in the back line at the minute can play that I think Welsh maybe can I see he's got the sort of passing range Um, he looks very comfortable on the ball so that's the kind of player that um, Ange is looking for Taylor is good on the ball, but his passing range isn't great. Um, I think he's a he can be a solid player, but I think if you're looking for someone to play the pass and go and get up and down the field, I don't think Taylor's the guy for there. We've already spoke about the right back situation, and I know we're looking to strengthen in there. And Starfelt coming in, Starfelt from the the kind of anal- analysis that we've seen um, is not someone who is outrageously strong in the tackle or strong in the air but he is someone who's good with the ball at his feet that's not to say he's a bad defender he is from what we've seen a good defender but he's a different player to the way you expect Ayer to be he's a big commanding um, no nonsense centre back that's not the way he is he's very comfortable with the ball at his feet we've seen Ayer being able to come forward as well um, and Starfelt doesn't look like that he just looks like someone who does his job and passes it on and that's more than capable enough to get through in Scottish football I think so. I think Starfelt certainly is encouraging in some ways in the statistics, uh, the statistics and analysis that we're seeing. But as with all these things, it's until we see him in the flesh that we'll really understand what kind of player we've got in our hands. He, he's an encouraging sign and certainly and, uh, shows it at the very least that Ange knows the places he needs to strengthen, which is encouraging as well. Um, Tony, moving further up the pitch, we've spoken about sorrow and... and you know, his, his rash tackles and his lack of positional discipline. Um, but I have to say, I'm going to go against my religion here and I'm going to criticise David Turnbull slightly because uh, there's only so often I can say that he looks classy when he's on... Yeah, so carrying on from what Laura's saying, at least if she's, she's having some technical issues again, Tony. Um, what was your thoughts on that? We talk about having to strengthen the defence ahead of Saturday but it looks as if Starfelt will be the only one that will come in. Uh, Laura, I think you're back now. I am back now. Uh, sorry about that. Sometimes I don't even realise I've dropped out <laughs> but that's just uh, that's probably just something to do with the way I talk. I don't know, maybe it's interference but uh, no, I'll go back to the question about, about Tony, Tony uh, to Tony about um, David Turnbull. Um, yeah, He's, he's classy on the ball and all sorts, but he didn't really have a great impact the other night, did he? And and, and it's something that does concern you about him going forward. I think that he, he might become a bit of a... a bit of a... Uh, let some games go by him. Do you know what? See, going into that second leg, from middle to front, you were confident that Celtic had enough in them to see off which on. It was a middle to front that let you down the other night. Mm. Right? McGregor scored a, wonder, a wonderful goal. But that apart, the whole midfield were generally posted missing against players that you think they could hold their own against. That, that was my own impression. You know, lots of people told me that Christie had a right good game. I, I didn't see that 
I don't think he, he had a poor game, but he didn't influence the game as much as he would want from the, the newfound attitude that Christie had. Turnbull as well. Turnbull it does look great when he's on the ball at times, but you're wanting more. You were wanting more from those guys the other night against, a, as I've already said, a bang average day in his team. Celtic should have no way to see them. And arguably the defence propped you up and kept you up for me. Money under immense pressure, but they were coping with what you're doing. And, and we all know about French, French Eddie. You know, people saying he, he's down tools. I, I refuse to believe that a player would actually down tools, but it's the first time I've looked at French Eddie and I've questioned his attitude and, and thought, you know, you are going through the motions here, you know. I, I don't accuse a player of deliberately just chucking it, but I think his head is elsewhere. You know, t- so, from, from middle to front, I felt really like down by Celtic the other night and not one of them of McGregor, Christie, Sorrow, Abada or Edward could raise their game to beat a poor Danish team. People say, oh, it's the team that competed in the Champions League last year. That was a shell of the team that competed in the Champions League last year. They sold about three or four players and others were missing. Mm-hmm. You know, Celtic should should have been able to beat them. And I stress, they went 1-0 up in both the matches. And so, I think it was Russell Boyce who made a fair point in Colin we were talking about. Ange want getting Celtic players to play a system that they're not familiar with. Ange maybe needs to adapt to the Scottish game first and, and then get his personnel in, the ones that he wants to play the Ange ball, to play the, the out from the back stuff and all that. You know, there's a needs must here. Celtic need to start getting results. First two competitive games, they're no register to win. They go to Tincastle on Saturday, first competitive game in the league and they need to go off their flyer. So maybe Ange needs to, you know, abandon some kind of tactic about playing out from the back and stuff in order to get get Celtic off to a winning start. Maybe have to sacrifice his principles a wee bit till he gets the players that he needs in and the players that are comfortable with playing the system he wants. Just a wee bit of tweaking, a wee bit of bending here. That's all that's required. But if Celtic continue to play the way Ange wants with the players and a system that's alien to the players, we'll come a cropper. I tell you what, sorry Laura, I was just going to say that you spoke about like Edward and kind of someone that, and I've seen the comments saying an empty jersey or didn't really try. See, for me, one of the biggest problems that I thought that team had on Wednesday night was fitness. And it's strange because it does seem as though it is a key thing on Ange's sort of mentality is that they've got to be fit, they've got to be right up for this. See, after about 60, 70 minutes, I felt as if we were knackered. We couldn't get out our own half. Anytime the ball was going up, it was just, it wasn't sticking and it was coming right back at us. And when the game went into extra time, I'm sitting going, we've got to make the subs now. We've got to make the subs before the start of the second half. And I'll, I'll touch on the subs in a second because if if you think you're a first team player sitting on that bench on Wednesday night and all you heard from the commentary team was, and you can't trust the players that's sitting on the bench. You can't trust the players that's sitting on the bench. If you can't be trusted in a game like that, just to go on and put a bit of energy into the team for 30 minutes and you think you're a first-team player, it's time for you to leave because you're not going to get the chance at Celtic. That's just for someone's own personal thing. We were knackered. We needed guys to come on. We only made the one sub. Even guys like I mean, Montgomery came on. That sub could have been done 10, 15 minutes earlier. A Yeti could have came on earlier. Those guys would have given you 30 minutes, 45 minutes, but we left it far too late. But what an indictment that is, Colin, if the manager thinks that these guys will not make a difference. You know, James Forrest made a difference when he came on yeah. and, and he missed a chance and people say, ah, it was too early. It's, I, I don't buy that. He's a professional football player. He had a free shot to go when he missed the target. And in a game of that magnitude, you can't miss a target. No blaming Forrest. I'm just talking about the actual action of sticking the ball in the net. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? These guys train. These are chances that are, you know, taken by every other team. Like in those situations, they're clinical. I mean, Michelin scored two goals by being clinical from two chances they created. So, uh, you know, that that's their job. When chances like arrive, I don't care who you're playing. You, you bury that. And if he buries it, it is a different complexion. He didn't. He went up the park and scored within seconds. That showed you how crucial that miss was. And as I say, I'm not blaming Forrest per se. It's just the, the whole kind of 
oh, oh well, he, he, it's too early. He, he hadn't adjusted to the game. That's garbage. That's a chance. That's a free shot to go. He was given. He should have mm-hmm. target. Right. And before anybody starts shouting, I'm not blaming Forrest. I'm just talking about the actual, uh, you know me, dedication to your craft. See a chance like that? You hit that in your sleep. And it's mm-hmm. not good. Right? Isn't that we are playing the occasion, the magnitude of the game? Stuff that. Right? That's that chances ten a penny bread and butter, you gobble it up or you should. Right? And it would have been it would have been made things different because Andrew referred to it in uh, his after match comments. So he knew it was a big moment in the match and it turned out to be the pivotal moment in the match because because Mitchell Land scored seconds later, the momentum gone and the energy seemed to sap from Celtic. I agree with that, Colin. I, I cannot for the life of me fathom why players are knackered in the second competitive game of the season. Somebody please explain that. Well, we'll, we'll go on and talk about the fitness in a minute because I've got some thoughts on that myself. But, um, but Colin, just to, to raise a point that Tony made about James Forrest. Now, he came on for Abada uh, coming into the match and I thought Abada was very quiet compared to what he had been the, the first couple of appearances he's made. I couldn't make up my mind whether it was because he was just letting the game pass him by or whether he'd been asked to play a more disciplined role because he seemed to stick out to that touchline like his life depended on it uh, in the game the other night and he was definitely coming in a lot more central in his previous couple of appearances and it had resulted in goals. Then he gets replaced by by James Forrest and James Forrest does what Abada had been doing the previous couple of games. Do you think do you think there's mixed messages there about what they were being asked to do? Do you think Abada wasn't doing what he was being asked to do and that's why he was taken off or is it is it difficult to tell? It was strange the whole game to be honest because I expected the Danes to come out from the word go and have a go at us because our defence is most likely the weakest part of our team uh, and I thought they'd come out and go all guns blazing knowing that you don't have to worry about the away goals because it's not a rule anymore so just go and have a go at us but they stood off us and I think that surprised Celtic as well Celtic get more of the possession than what they could have anticipated in the first half Um, and it was the decision making at times that let Celtic down so I'm thinking about passes that could have been made two, three seconds earlier. The sharpness just wasn't there. And to be honest, like, Abada came into the team and he was getting down that right-hand side. And to be fair to him, Ralston was coming down the right-hand side with him. Tony said, enough, he's gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but both Abada and Ralston were coming down that right-hand side. But when you're playing the ball in, Edward wasn't getting into the box. He wasn't committing himself to get across his man to challenge for the ball. So it didn't matter how many good crosses both either of the two of them put in. There was nobody there that wanted to go and throw themselves at the ball. So I think the difference you're seeing there is Abada probably didn't have his best game. But he's, if you'd have got one or two of them crosses on Edward's head, we'd all been saying Abada had a great game. Mm-hmm. This is the, the difference coming from whether it's an assist or it's not an assist. If he can put the ball across and somebody scores, you're going, right, fantastic, great game. But the way he was playing on Wednesday night, it was like there was nobody there helping him and that affected his game massively. Good point there, Tony. You know, our perceptions of how somebody plays very often depends on, on another another player that they're servicing or another player that they're getting service from. And that probably leads us uh, through a good uh, transition to speak about Edward. Now, anybody who wants to know my thoughts on Edward and he's continued... Uh, presence at the club only needs to watch the post-match coverage uh, from the other night I was on with Brian and Paul I made my feelings very clear on that so I don't think I need to say much more but Tony I'll come to you Edward probably one of his most lacklustre performances I've seen in a Celtic shirt it's time for him to go is it not? Oh yeah I mean I, I think you know I think JP Mason nailed it if his head's out the door his feet should fall I mean uh, that's that's just that isn't it and I think the problem now is, I wrote a column about this in the Celtic Week yesterday and I said the Celtic fans no longer want to be Edward. He's no longer the adored. No, the Jitem has turned to the Jitem de Test, right? <laughs> the fans are now kind of, they loved them, doing various things and scoring certain goals. They're now starting to turn on him big time and hating on him. And I hate that for any player. The time is right. And also, if the Brighton money is right, the price is right, you just have to just say, au revoir, that's your 
Celtic chapter over. Thank you. Because this can't persist. And Ange also has to concentrate on the team now. You know, can't have distractions like that kicking about. You know, I know he's the best forward that we've got, but he's not proving it at the minute. He just, I don't know what's happening with French Eddie, but his heart's not in it by the looks of it. And if your heart and your head aren't in it, then you're no use to a club like Celtic. Because sometimes the heart can get you through games where it's maybe not happening. But, you know, that, that will to win, that spirit, that, you know, playing for that crest, that jersey, that can spur you on. It, it's doing it's doing neither for uh, Eddie just now. He's head somewhere in England or somewhere abroad or somewhere away from Celtic. But the problem is, when you look the other night, he was still the best attacking option that we had. So he had to play. But whilst he's playing, he has to give you a shift. And if you're not going to give you a shift, then he may as well sit on the bench with the others. Mm-hmm. You know, and his call and says, give a, give a jetty a try or, or whoever. You know, but I think it's time. So Celtic have to sort this out for the manager as well. You know, uh, the board have to say, right, enough's enough. This man wants to leave. He's been wanting to leave for the best part of a year and has not... Still the top goal scorer last season, so the stats will say he did perform. But it's now time that the manager has to get on with the job with the players that want to be there. So guys like Eddie have to be jettisoned. You go to Brighton or Crystal Palace or whoever and say, let's do this deal. It has to be done so the manager can find and source a suitable replacement and get on with the job of managing Celtic. Ange now has to put Celtic first, second and third. Said, also said that yesterday. It's now about the team and the players and the personnel that Celtic have to bring in, which is what we're, where are Angie's further reinforcements. This man has to be back to bring in the team that he wants, to play the system he wants. You see, if he doesn't, he'll continue to make the statements that I've tried, maybe I wasn't forceful enough, I'm not being a martyr. This is a guy that's like, listen, I want players. It, it's more or less a Blame them. Blame those upstairs. So things like Eddie need to be sorted. It shouldn't have dragged out to the start of the season. He should have been gone and somebody in, in his position, in his place. But typical Celtic, this is what they do. And so what do you do on Saturday? Does he play? Would you play him on Saturday? You've got a big dilemma there, haven't you? An, an absolute massive dilemma. If the man's head and heart's out the door, he has to go. It's as simple and straightforward as that. Yeah, I think so. I think the bigger problem that we have is if we decide we're not playing him, a jetty didn't come on the other night and stamp his authority on, on the shirt. And that's an, another massive issue. Colin, um, based on what Tony says there, he, he was a lot more measured in his comments than I was the other night. I was a lot more driven by emotion, but the, the gist of the comments were, were the same. Uh, are we... Are we speaking with our hearts more than our heads at the moment? Are we just frustrated at the fact that he does want to leave? Or is there enough there to suggest that no, his performances aren't satisfactory and, and, and we should be expecting more from him while he's still in a Celtic shirt? I think if you're a number nine for Celtic, you get judged on your goals. And so far, he's not done that this season. And people can say there's only been a certain amount of games, but he's never really looked like scoring at any point either. Um, and the, the two the two kind of competitive games that we've had so far, a Yeti in pre season looked pretty impressive um, up to the point where he was basically dropped for Edward to come back in. I'm not saying that a Yeti's going to go and give you an outstanding performance on Saturday. I don't think that will be the case. I don't even know. It looks as if he's only just coming back from another injury, so he might only be able to give you sixty minutes on on Saturday. But even I, I think you were being quite harsh there on him. I think even in the fifteen minutes that he was on the park, he, he put more effort in than what Edward did in 105. I mean, the first thing he did is come on and get booked. That was the most energy I'd seen a, a Celtic player put in for about half an hour. Now, I'm not saying that's ideal. Somebody's going to say, oh, did you want him to get booked? No. Look, I just want to see a striker up there that's going to buzz about, is going to be chasing everything down, is going to try and get involved and link up the play. We needed an outball on Wednesday because we were getting bombarded time after time again. And every time the ball went up to Edward, they lost it. Sviachenko kind of knocked him off the ball and I think it was the start of extra time. Um, and I think that led to the, the yellow card for Soro, maybe. Maybe that's where he got his first one. Um, we've got to 
have an outball. Tynecastle is one of the hardest places to go to in Scotland. I know they're just a recently promoted side, but that is a really difficult game. There's only about 6,000 there, but it's going to feel like a full house. And if Edward's not up for it, we can't afford to be a man down going into that game. We we need to go and we need performances out of all 11 players that's going to be playing on Saturday. And if he doesn't think that he can give 100% for Celtic, he shouldn't be starting. See, for me, problem though, efforts, efforts are prerequisite. You know, that that's that just that's a tick in the box before you even pull on a Celtic jersey. You give your all and you give effort. I, that's a given for me. I, mm-hmm. if you don't give effort, I, I would I would hold them off. And I would have hauled Eddie off. I don't know how he managed to stay on the park for 105 minutes, you know. But the manager turned and looked and thought, don't trust a jetty. Bottom line, you know, and that says something about a jetty then. I know he, he, you know, as you say, he, he might be injury prone or whatever, but if you cannot, you know, win the battle for the, the striker jersey with a, an Edward who seems to be disinterested, then you've got problems. And again, I go back to it, this is something that should have been sorted. So Celtic take whatever fee they get, give PSG their, their slice of the action, there's still something left over to try and bring in somebody, as you say, who will run the channels, who will score goals, who will head the ball into the net, who will do all these things. That's why you have a scouting system. If they can't identify that player, then, my goodness, what a state. Celtic are in a worse state than I ever thought. And you don't want to be negative and critical, but these are these things are now coming home to roost. There's no building blocks are in place at all by the looks of it. It's very haphazard. It's very sketchy. It's almost making it up as you go along stuff. You see, mm-hmm. you're telling me that a Celtic player, you know, has to give effort, then I'd hunt you at the door. He was, yeah, that's a prerequisite for me. Effort. You know, you, I and Laura would pull on that strip tomorrow and burst an absolute gut. Right? In the first two minutes and along in the first <laughs> couple of things. <laughs> and then get subbed off. <laughs> You'd need a Mars bar jacket and an iron lung insertion, right? After ten minutes. That's neither here nor there. But you would burst your gut. You see, if three players don't do that, I mean, there's a, there's a no... An old Bill Shankly carton, it's brilliant. You know, and he gives it. And if you pay a man to do what he's got to do, they get well paid. And see if he doesn't do it, he's a menace to society. I'd throw him in jail. That's the way I feel about Celtic players that don't try. You know what I mean? He, he said it in the gruff voice, a menace to society. I'd throw him in jail. <laughs> right, that's the way he said it. And it's brilliant, right? But back then, you're talking about guys giving effort. You know what I mean? You're just like, you know... What, what is it with the modern day players that think they can just coast through life getting paid a fortune and, and not give their all? You're no, you're no use to Celtic Football Club if that's the way you think you can you know, you can go about your daily business and your Celtic career. I've told you before, I'm all about application and attitude. You know, it's it's dedication to your craft. And I don't see a lot of Celtic players at this moment in time being as dedicated to their craft as they should be. And I think the manager sees that as well. Mm-hmm. Which is why he's getting totally and utterly frustrated with everything that's going on at the club at the minute. Well, I think that's a fair point that you raise. I think for all the criticism that you could level at Celtic at the moment, they have a man do away with their problems, even if he's not able to solve them at the minute. I have to say, Tony, if you were talking about taking players off for lack of effort then we'd have been in a lot of bother for many games last season because I don't know if we'd have had a, any players on the pitch but um, that, we'll leave you Why has that been allowed to continue? Yeah, it's 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 crazy, it's crazy and it's it's a culture and, and something that's set in I think amongst the players that he probably has come in and can't believe but we'll, we'll leave Tuesday there for now as the banner says at the bottom, Carol Starfelt f- looks uh, set to face Hearts where, Ange, uh, where are Ange's further reinforcements Colin, I was having a wee look at the transfer rumours today, obviously Joe Hart is dominating the headlines, his possible transfer to Celtic uh, is, is in the offing again because he's Premier League even though he's third choice goalkeeper at a club wages look like there'll be a problem Ben Foster at Watford's been named as well but I think anybody who even gives a cursory glance at his YouTube channel and his podcast knows that that's not a goer he's he's got other plans I think mm-hmm. um, 
first of all, I know you might have talked this about this on Wednesday, but for, for anybody watching who maybe didn't see on Wednesday, what are your thoughts about Joe Hart possibly coming in as an option for, for goalkeeping if we assume that wages don't become a stumbling block? Yeah, look, see as it stands, Joe Hart coming in would be a benefit to the Celtic side just now. Um, it might not be the goalkeeper that a lot of people want. It might not be the goalkeeper that maybe even uh, Ange had his heart set on. Heart, I, I didn't even mean that. Um, yeah. But you're a poet. Think, and you don't know it. That's uh, what it is. I'm coming for. I'm coming for your job, Kevin. Um, <laughs> no, but honestly, he, he will come in, and he, he's got that experience, and he's got the the. He's not had a great run over the last couple of years um, and he is prone to the odd mistake here and there but at the minute I've got three goalkeepers that play for Celtic and I don't know which one of them is the number one I couldn't trust any of the three of them I don't think Bain had a terrible performance through the week but we've seen time and time again he's not capable of making the top saves um, Joe Hart when he was at Manchester City if you had him on that form is a fantastic signing for Celtic the fact that he hasn't been up to that level for the last couple of years you're, you're hoping that he's someone that comes up here and sees it as a chance to completely reset his career I mean take a look back to one of Celtic's first signings under Rodgers it was Craig Gordon eh, sorry not under Rodgers under Dyla Craig Gordon a guy that hadn't played football in the best part of two and a bit years and then he comes in he hits the ground running and he probably is one of our best signings over the last 10 years we paid nothing for him and he put in some great performances we knew he wasn't perfect but he still gave his all for the team and he still saved us a, a good few times. If Joe Hart can, can come in and do that, he'll win over a lot of the Celtic support. I'm not saying that he's the, the best signing we'll make this summer, but I do think he's a decent addition to the squad. I, I I have my own thoughts on it I, I, I personally don't know that he's a personality type that I would like around the dressing room he, unless he's been humbled a, an awful lot in the last few years yeah. uh, things I've seen previously make me wonder whether his, his, his attitude would go down very well in the, in, the, in the dressing room but maybe I'm wrong maybe there's a lot of players that have, that have the attitude that he's got and maybe he would fit in Tony I'll come to you for your thoughts on Joe Hart one thing that does concern me is if if Ange is going to persist with this um, sweeper keeper um, type of play and wanting a keeper who's uh, good with the ball at his feet, Joe Hart was let go from Man City for that very reason under Pep Guardiola because Guardiola didn't feel like he had that skill. Are we out of the frying pan and into the fire if we bring him in in that case? Give me a second. I was looking through my contact book there. I just happened to turn to S. I've got Peter Shelton number. <laughs> <laughs> He's maybe give him a ring and see if he fancies doing a return. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I looked at his Peter Shelton, bro. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, honestly, I I think any goalkeeper, someone like Joe Hart, can do the basics. He can keep the ball at the net, first and foremost. Celtic need that, right? Now, you talk about, uh, that was one man's opinion, Pep Guardiola, with the sweeper-keeper thing, right? And seemingly like Pep Guardiola, you know, if he doesn't like you, that's it, you're bombed. Right, there is no coming back. That they're just getting out the door, you know. Pep Guardiola, you no, know, he's many things, but he's been trying to reinvent the wheel with, with regards to football, you know, overcomplicating things and doing various things his way. So, I'm I'm in Collins camp there. Joe Hart is a goalkeeper of repute. You don't lose that ability to save the ball. You don't lose the ability to be an influence. And if you say, Laura, yeah, maybe some things off the field of maybe you know are, are to not to people's liking, but I think he'd actually come in and be a, a good influence in that dressing room. Be that experienced voice. Be the guy who's been there, seen it and done it, and say to the other people, this is how it is. This is how it's done. This is the best way to do it. And as I say, it was one man's opinion that he couldn't play the sweeper-keeper. You, know, like, you know, let's get somebody like Joe Hart in to prove, you know, because he's, he's, he's not played much football. So I think there will be some humility there, Laura. You know, because and, and you get a chance to play in front of 50, 60,000 again at a decent level. You know, I, I think Joe Hart would, would grasp that. You know, we'd want to do that rather than languish in Tottenham reserves or, you know, or not play at all. So I, I think it's a great opportunity for him to reinvent himself, resurrect his career at a club, you know, who could do with somebody like that in between the sticks. 
you know, we we badly need a goalkeeper, but we need a goalkeeper first and foremost that can do the def what the definition of a goalkeeper is to stop the opposition from scoring. Uh, I mean, it's, it's totally, again, I go back to it. It's, I'm very one dimensional at times in tunnel vision, but it's just plain and simple as that. We need a guy that can save the ball. Joe Hart fits that bill. If a deal can be done, go and get him and see where we go from here. See, as it stands, right? If you were to sign Hart today, he'd be able to go into that squad for tomorrow. And I know some people say, I, I, I don't want him in the squad, right? And I, I get that side of it. See, if you go and sign someone else from another league outside the UK, you're going to have that game on Saturday, you're going to have the following game on the Thursday, and potentially the Dundee game on the Sunday, before you can even get him into the squad. Can we afford to go another three games without bringing somebody in? That's why I'm saying the targets, although there's some great targets out there and you're seeing guys like Christian Lovrich being linked with the club, we do have to look at some UK-based players. The the one that's going through the chat at the minute is maybe Benjamin Segrist from Dundee United. I don't know what Celtic's view is on that. I don't know if they see him as maybe, um, I'll say not good enough, but you can't say that when a lot of the goalkeepers you've got at the minute aren't good enough to put on the Celtic jersey. But we do have to start looking at UK-based players because these guys can come in right away and they can make an impact instead of dragging out deals like the the Buta deal and then it's another two weeks before we can even see them in the training squad. We're, we we need about seven or eight players at least. Probably more. Some people will say 10 to 14, right? The time that it's going to take to get these guys in is going to be too far into the season. We have to look at, we need two right backs. One of them should be for the UK and one of them can be from abroad. And the one that comes in from the UK, he gets a jersey first and then that guy that's coming in, you fight him for it. Not literally fighting for it, but you you do it in training and you try and win that jersey back. We need to start staying local to bring guys in because it's going to get to the point where time and time is going to drag on and it's going to be too far into the season. <laughs> Sorry, the problem that you're coming across there, Colin, is you're assuming that the Celtic board have planned for this situation have planned for restrictions that let's not forget every other club in the country every other club in the world is dealing with we had Neil Lennon on 5 Live again last night uh, talking about how Covid had been a major factor in the failures of the team last season and and I say again to, to these people that continue to bring that up there is not a person on this planet who has not been affected by COVID, it cannot be used as an excuse. It cannot be used as an excuse. Like you say, a simple measure like identifying a UK based player would eliminate a lot of these issues. Now I'm not saying they're going to be first choice, but we've mm-hmm. all had we've all had to make some sacrifices over the year. Celtic should be no different. There are certainly players who are UK based who are better than what we have at the club at the moment and could come in and effectively be in the team immediately. Look at Carol Starfelt. We knew he was in isolation probably 10 days ago was that Instagram post went up where he was mm-hmm. in isolation yeah. in the in the hotel room. He only gets announced yesterday. He only trains for the first time with the team yesterday or today even. He's prob- probably not that's so lucky to see him in the squad uh, for Dundee. It's it, it's a situation where you think, and Tony, I'll come to you on this. How often can lack of planning be made an excuse for what is going on at the club at the moment? Well, it's year in, year out. There's a lack of planning, and you know me, I like my online excuse references. It's just going back to that that great clip of a Celtic board member saying there'll be no panic buying, just panic. That's just a situation we find ourselves in right now. You know, they're panicking. And, you know, and how long have we said on this pod, look closer to home, look at what's under your nose. These are players that could have been brought in the minute Ange was in the door. You know them. You say to Ange, or, or, or Ange, Ange she's right. One of the first things you would say, what's under my nose? From the put a list of players under his nose. Right, we've spoken about them. St Johnston won two cups last season with a rigid defence. 
I don't think one of those defenders would be, again, I use the phrase, a person of interest. You know, somebody that you might want to sign for your club. If not, fine. You know what I mean? Lewis Ferguson, Aberdeen. You know, another player that could have been brought in, Alan Campbell, Motherwell. You know, guys like that. Midfield and force up or whatever. You know, Kevin Nisbet, Habs keeps floating around. You know, see if you're really serious about these players, you go and get them. Mm-hmm. None of this haggling anymore. Do you know, lessons should have been learned from John McGinn and Ivan Tony, things like that, right? If you're really serious about wanting British based players and some that are under your nose from clubs you're going to play against, then go and say to them how much. You know what I mean? How much? And if they inflate it, so be it. You're going to have to bite the bullet. Because you can't very well command top for the likes of Ayer and Eddie and then play hardball with clubs who are doing the same thing back to yourself. Mm-hmm. It's so, total double standards. But if these players are guys you want in your team, then go and get them. Uh, and I can't for the life of me understand year upon year they make the same mistakes with the Champions League, but this is one of the worst in terms of just planning and organisation. I've got a haphazard team getting in for the first game of the season against mm-hmm. Hart. It's a shocking and unbelievable state of affairs. I don't blame the manager at all. Right? The manager does not get... That's Peter Shelton giving Tony a phone. Tony's <laughs> <laughs> available. No, 500 a game, 500 a, a clean sheet. Um, <laughs> oh, it's, it's unbelievable the way the, the way the board has let this situation drag on from February when we knew Neil Lennon was out the door. And we are at the point now, we are panicking. I don't care what MD says. The manager's starting to get frustrated. He's starting to panic. And those upstairs, genuinely, I feel, don't know where we're going. Colin, I'll put this to you, right? Based on what Tony said, to to nick a couple of names from from what he said, I tell you what you could do for a fraction of the price of some of the players that we are looking at. Xander Clark at St Johnston. Mm -hmm. Declan Gallagher before he made his move. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan Campbell and Lewis Ferguson and Kevin Nisbet. There you've identified a spine of a team that you could make that mm-hmm. are surely better than some of the options we have. Are they all Celtic quality players? Maybe not. Are they better than what we currently have and could they give us a foundation on to, uh, to build on? Absolutely. What, what are your thoughts on that? You raised the, the, you know, the, the point of UK-based players being a target. Is there anybody that particularly sticks out to you that, that we should be going after? I mean, a lot of those players you're saying there, um, obviously Gallagher's moved, he's moved to Aberdeen, Campbell's away to, I think it's Luton. Um, but there's, there is other ones out there that, I mean, there's there's young talent coming through here that is, teams are looking to make the, the move to sell them on. Look at Aaron Hickey making his move to Hearts. We knew he wasn't ready to play into that Celtic first team, but we had the chance to bring him in and develop him. Um, and see the level that they could get to. You see the exact same situation happening at the minute with Hibs, with Josh Doig, um, another young player who, um, again, very young, but you can see he's got potential there, and it's someone that you should be trying to get in before the bigger teams come in, so you can get them at a fraction of the price as opposed to what you're then going to be able to sell them on. We, We said this, right? Every year that Celtic doesn't make Europe or doesn't make the Champions League, there's always one player that you say, right, OK, um, we didn't make the Champions League this year. Kieran Tierney's went to Arsenal. That's £25 million. We've recovered that. Uh, Odds and Edward, uh, sorry, not Edward, um, Moussa Dembele going to Leon. That's a £20 million. Pound. You've recovered that. This season, it looks as if they're doing it with Ayer and Edward, and that's the, the £30-odd million pound that you've recovered now. The recruitment's got to the stage now that if we don't make the Champions League next season and if we don't make a, a substantial amount of income, there's not one player in that team where you'd say they're the guy that's going to be the, the guy that we move on for the big money. So and, and to jump in, sorry there, the other point that you're making is as we've got worse, we've gone from being able to sell one player to make up that money to having to sell two. So, yeah. you know, it's 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 a one of these things where it's a never-ending circle that things... As we get worse, the value of our players decreases and then we can't make back the money. Tony, it, it, this this whole Champions League thing and being out of the Champions League thing for what I think is now the fourth year in a row, yep. that is going to cripple us as much as anything, is it not? Of course it is. What recruitment, I'd say, 
in that sentence there. Mm. Question mark. What is scouting? What scouting? You know, what, what's happening? What, you know, what, what's happening here? Why, why is, you know, we were promised a, you know, a revamp of everything. Still don't have a DOF. You know what I mean? Or the head of recruitment or, or whatever you want to call them. You know? I, I, and I genuinely do think that Ange now has to turn around and say to the board, I want my own men around me. For a start. Right? Yep. Just turn around and say, I want my own management team. I want, you know, I want this, you know, as a DOF or a, you know, or a, a head scout or whatever. Because he, he needs that now. There needs to be a total clear out of of the kind of dead that's hanging about or from the failures of last season. Because it's just getting absolutely ridiculous, you know, because nothing appears to be happening. How, as a, as a football club, and I get back to it, masquerading as a big club, we're not a big club anymore. Everything's downsizing, everything's, you know, it's 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 penny pinching. But where are the people, and I keep saying to them, the scouts, those who people who should be identifying players, how come every time on this show we identify players and we say to them, why are they not interested in them? Why is this person not a person of interest or a player of interest? You know, not just uh, UK-based players, foreign players as well. What are Celtic doing? If you and I can see that from our basic knowledge of watching Scottish, European, world football, how can they not see it? You know what I mean? The one deal that was done was Ange, the hands of Ange, Burahashi, and it was done in minutes because he went, I want him, get him in, right? And again, time, time constraints, he can't play on Saturday. Right, fair enough, that's fine. But do you know what? See, moving forward, see the hand of Angers and every other transfer moving forward. That'll do me because there'll be some structure and some plan in place then. They might actually listen to what the manager's saying. The manager has put out an SOS for help. If you give them the help, then we start judging them. But at this moment in time, he's going to, he's going to start to be judged by Saturday. And if Celtic lose or draw on Saturday, the worm will turn on Ange. And it's unfair. You are asking a man to compete in a boxing match with one hand behind his back and saying, but do your best. Well, Tony, <laughs> I, I, think you make, I think you make an awful lot of good points there. I think if Andrews is forceful with his, his desired signings, as he appears to be in his interviews, then, like you say, I would back him to the hilt. I was a bit concerned when you said, where are the people? Because it sounded an awful <laughs> lot like something else. But well, Yeah, I was concerned there as well. <laughs> I was <laughs> to but again, the, the Furuhashi thing, it, it, the time constraints are not something that we've not known about. If, if he had been able to bring him in two weeks before he did, yeah. then he would be able to play tomorrow and, and we're, we're, we're stuck. Um, Colin, we'll, we'll move on to, to the game against Hearts tomorrow. Um, uh, there is going to be 5,000 Jambos fans in the stadium. Um it's not going to be the same as a, a normal season opener at Tynecastle, but uh, I mean, I'm worried going into it. Cheer me up. Find me some positives. <laughs> find me some. Find me something to look forward to about this match that will get us off to a kicker. Uh, uh, the kickoff's not till eight o'clock, so you can be um, you can have as much as much alcohol <laughs> if that is your your choice beforehand. Um, you talk about it. So, oh, definitely, I may help him. Um, <laughs> speaking about that, just on a, a kind of offset, did anybody see that video for last season? The boy scoring in non-league. He scores the goal and then goes to the fans and the fans have got the pint in the hand and he t- takes a drink of the pint to celebrate. No, definitely. Oh, what, yeah, what? did he not get booked for that? He no? did get booked for that, aye. Can you imagine <laughs> something like that happening in Scotland? That would be wild. <laughs> um, obviously, it can't happen because we don't sell drink, but that's another argument for another day. Look, the, the game on Saturday is going to be difficult. I know a lot of people saying um, Hearts aren't that great. No, look, they've got a team that's got some uh, very experienced players in there. Um, and every game there, I think, is a, a struggle. Um, the last time I can think of us being very comfortable through there was when we beat them 7 0 in the League Cup, and that was a good few years ago. Um, look, we're going to go in with a, an inexperienced backline. We've got to make sure that we protect them there's going to be some players who um, 
<laughs> the team's going to be different, I think, to the team that played through the week. I, I do think that we can't continue with that team, but they played 120 minutes. There's going to be some very, very tired legs. I think Bain will start in goal again. I think he'll continue with him. I don't think he made any mistakes that say that we drop him. Uh, I think the back four will probably change. I, I think we could see Rookie Day coming in. Um, I think there's a chance we could see him play. Um, we may also see Starfelt coming in as well, which if that's the case, then Dane Murray will drop onto the bench. The midfield three, the big one's going to be Sorrow and whether we can trust them to, to play the 90 minutes. And as Tony says, don't give away the stupid fouls and don't give away the, the bookings because when he's on the ball, he's actually very good. His passing range is, is very, very good. But at times when he's chasing the ball down, he can give away the silly fouls and we can't really afford to do that, especially when the defence isn't fully set yet. You don't want to have set piece after set piece coming into the box. Up front, the big decision is where you stay with Edward, do you go with a Yeti? Personally, I would start with a Yeti. Give him 60 minutes, see what he can do, um, and then see if Edward's got anything in him to come off and, and play 30 minutes. And I mean, there's scouts watching him. I know he knows there's a move coming for him, but surely you'd be trying to impress these scouts. I know you don't want to get injured, but I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it with him. I'll go with Yeti to start up front. I think Forrest might come in and maybe we'll see him and Abada switching sides. Um, a three of McGregor, Turnbull and Sorrow um, and a back four with Starfelt in it. And while we're at it, I'll ask you for a prediction, Colin, before I go to Tony. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I, I want to finish this show with a positive. Um, I, I want to say that we'll get the, the victory. Um, I don't know what it will be. It might be 6-5, it might be 2-1. I don't know with this Celtic team at the minute, but... Um, I'll just go with a victory. Go with a victory. Sitting firmly, well, not too firmly on the fence. A, a true sitting on the fence would have been a draw, obviously. But <laughs> Tony, Tony, I'll come to you. Um, a, another positive Tyne Castle, Tyne Castle opener I can think of was uh, Scott Sinclair's debut. I believe that was that Brendan Rodgers' first match yeah. as well. And, yep. and yes. Sinclair scored and it was all looking rosy and we... Didn't know what lay ahead of us the next four years. My goodness, uh, that was that was something to look back on. But back to tomorrow and being a bit more realistic. Uh, what do you think of Colin's selections there? Is there any changes you would make to what we've seen? Uh, do, do you anticipate a good performance tomorrow? I don't think that we've got the personnel to make any changes to Colin's kind of. <laughs> 11, yeah. uh, I don't disagree. To be honest, was most of what you say that the, the French Eddie Ajetti one was probably the, the conundrum for him. I think Starfelt will start as well because he needs somebody at the back of the pack, some reassuring presence there. I can see it being a, I'm going to say a positive outcome, like four three or something. I think it might be one of those rip roaring free scoring games, non not boring kind of games. But I think Celtic will win. Have to win, really, don't they? I mean, let's let's be honest, but. On your thing, Colin, I think George Best once took a swig out of a can. So, <laughs> on the Easter Road by Rangers fans, I'm sure, Boxing Day. Uh, sometime 1980 or 81, something like that. Uh, I would have been about 79 or 80, around about then. Uh, and he took a swig out of a, a beer can, I believe, thrown at him at a corner flag. So, there you go. So, I think uh, I think George Best was a better player inebriated than most are sober. If, if well, I, I, I believe so, Laura. Yes, he, uh, he was he was a very skillful player. Yes, very. I, a, I a material you, talent. I think they'll call him. You know? mm. I tell you what, he just going on about the the two one game there. Just before we wrap up, am I right in saying that Scott Sinclair signed that morning before he played? Yeah, yeah. I think. Could so, yeah. we have yeah. a super signing coming in tomorrow morning before the game? Oh. Well, I, oh. can be anybody can you play would, up front <laughs> it would certainly not be as exciting as Scott Sinclair uh, that's for sure but uh, but we'll, we'll leave it there for today technical issues aside apologies for those at the start thankfully or maybe not thankfully for some of you watching I was able to contribute to most of the podcast uh, I will be off next week uh, so there will be a, uh, somebody in my place who knows the Friday lineup might be entirely different although I believe Tony will still be here for his for his sins uh, thanks Colin thanks Tony for 
for your con contributions today. Thanks everybody for your comments on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Unfortunately, because of my technical issues today, I couldn't see any of those. Um, but if you haven't already, uh, please subscribe to the State of Mind YouTube channel. And remember that if you do subscribe, you'll automatically be entered in that draw for the amazing uh, Verve uh, Platinum Disc Collection. Uh, I think it's Platinum Disc Collection um, yep. that is being given away. Uh, if you want to see more about that, then go on to uh, our boss almighty Paul John Dykes' Twitter account and just view that and see see what's up for grabs. Um, anybody who has already subscribed will also be in that draw. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Tony. Come on the hoops for the start of the opening league season, and we will see you again for the match coverage very soon. <laughs>